Myself, Dr. Jibran Ahmad presents to you Simply Pathology and today we are back with a very important video. Today we will discuss Cell as a Unit of Health and Disease Part 4. So in this lecture, we are mainly going to focus on the mitochondrial function and after that we are going to read about the cell signaling pathways along with the different kinds of receptors. So let us start with the cellular metabolism and mitochondrial function. Now the mitochondria is containing their own DNA, okay, they have their own DNA very importantly. Now and this own DNA of the mitochondria is encoding 1% of the total cellular proteins and approximately 20% of the proteins which are involved in oxidative phosphorylation, okay, oxidative phosphorylation. So mitochondria is responsible for synthesis of 1% of total cellular protein and approximately 20% of the proteins which are involved in oxidative phosphorylation. It can carry all the steps of DNA replication, transcription, translation, okay, and this is very much similar to the present day bacteria. Now, since the ovum, since the ovum is contributing the vast majority of cytoplasmic organelles in a fertilized zygote, therefore the mitochondrial DNA is almost entirely maternally inherited. Okay, it is almost entirely maternally inherited. Mitochondrial proteins encoded by both nuclear and mitochondrial DNA. Okay, remember the mitochondrial proteins. So, whatever proteins are present inside the mitochondria, they are encoded by both the nuclear DNA, that, that is the DNA of the entire cell, that is the nuclear DNA, okay, as well as by mitochondrial DNA. So, one DNA is present inside the main cell, that is the nucleus another is present inside the mitochondria. So, both of them are encoding certain proteins which are working inside the mitochondria. Therefore, any kind of mitochondrial disorders can either be X-linked or it can be autosomal or it can be maternally inherited. Now, mitochondria is also supporting their own renewal and they also defend against degenerative changes. Mitochondria, remember, they are quite short-lived, okay, the T-half being 1 to 10 days, but on, on, on an average, the lifespan of mitochondria is approximately 10 days, okay. They are degraded mainly via process of autophagy, also known as mitophagy. Now, two very important functions carried out by the mitochondria is, number one, oxidative phosphorylation and number two, apoptosis. So, let us begin with the functions of the mitochondria. Number one, we will read about energy generation. So, what we have to keep in mind over here at, as of this point of time is the fact that always remember that the mitochondria, now this structure that we are looking at, this is the mitochondria, okay. So, let us see the different structures inside the mitochondria, okay. So, we are going to start from the outer. So, on the outer aspect, we are having the outer membrane protein, okay, labeled as OM. Then we have the inner membrane, okay. So, outer membrane is there, then inner membrane is there. So, this is the inner membrane, this is the outer membrane, okay. Now, the inner membrane is containing the enzymes which are participating in the electron transport chain or the respiratory chain, okay, which is basically responsible for oxidative phosphorylation. Now, in between the outer and inner membrane, we are having an inner membrane space, okay, that is inner membrane space, which is the site of ATP generation, okay. So, is this very clear? Now, just beneath the inner membrane, just inside to the inner membrane, this space that is there, this is called as the core space. So, this is called as the core space where all the enzymes for the glycolytic and tricyclic acid cycle is present. Okay, this is the core membrane space. Okay, so these are the normal important structures. So these are the normal important structures that is there. So, first of all, we are going to read about energy generation. So, the major source of energy inside the cell, okay, it is the mitochondria which is also called as the powerhouse of the cell where it, the energy generation is mainly taking in the form of oxidative phosphorylation. So, any kind of substrate, okay, is oxidized to carbon dioxide and in the process of oxidation, okay, they are driving the proton pump, okay, which is going to pump the H plus ions which are present in the core matrix of the mitochondria to the intermembrane space, okay, to the intermembrane space. So, this is basically driven by the oxidation of the substrate wherein, you know, proton pumps are working and they are transferring the electrons. So, in the process, the H plus ions, okay, from the core matrix. So, H plus ions from the core matrix, they are getting pumped into the intermembrane space as we have seen. So, this is what is happening. Now, what has happened that, that this process is taking place to the extent where the concentration of H plus ions becomes very high in the intermembrane space, okay. So, the concentration of this H plus, okay, it becomes very, very high inside the intermembrane space, 
okay and as a result what will happen this h plus ions will now come back to the core matrix space okay and this this is taking place along the concentration gradient and in this process when they are going back there is ATP generation. So, this H plus ion when they are going from the intermembrane space into the core matrix space along the concentration gradient there is an ATP generation during this process. So, this is how normally the mitochondria is synthesizing ATP or generating ATP okay via oxidative phosphorylation which is the major pathway of ATP generation inside the mitochondria. So, I hope you have understood this point very clearly okay. okay. Now, very importantly normally remember this entire ETS that is the electron transport chain that we have seen that uh, you know where there is uh, you know uh, generation of electron and where the proton pump is working and they are pumping the electrons and then the H plus ions they are pumped. So, this entire ETS chain that is taking place is coupled with ATP generation as we have already seen. So, as the substrate oxidation is going on and as this oxidation is driving the proton pump okay, which is pumping the H plus uh, uh, from the core towards the intermembrane space. So, in this process at the end there is ATP generation yes. So, normally this ETS chain or this oxidation chain is coupled with ATP generation. Now, sometimes this process might become uncoupled means this ETS chain okay, they might not become coupled with ATP generation and how does it happen whenever in this particular process there is participation by a particular protein called as uncoupling protein 1 also called as thermogenin then what they will do they will uncouple the ETS chain with the ATP generation. So, in the process only heat generation will occur without any ATP generation. And this is also called as non-shivering thermogenesis and may basically this type of, of uh, this type of heat generation is taking place in the brown fat mainly, okay. okay. Not only this because uh, you know in this entire process of ATP generation, okay, this is a very big metabolic pathway that is taking place. There is a lot of reactive oxygen species that is also produced. So, I hope you have basically understood that how the mitochondria is playing an important role in energy generation, okay. The ETS chain the H plus pumping out, then the H plus coming back, ATP generation is there via, via oxidative phosphorylation. The concept of, of uh, thermogenesis that is non-shivering thermogenesis is also achieved over here. The second important function of mitochondria is intermediate metabolism. Now, remember normally this oxidative phosphorylation that we have just seen is generating approximately 36 to 38 ATP per glucose molecule. Now, in this process of ATP generation, no metabolic intermediates are produced, which is normally required for building up nucleic acid, sugar moieties, lipid, protein, etc. Therefore, in case of rapidly dividing cells like the benign as well as malign, not only the cancer cells, but also any rapidly dividing cell in our body, they show an increased uptake of glucose and glutamine and they switch their, you know, metabolism from oxidative phosphorylation to aerobic glycolysis and this switching from oxidative phosphorylation to aerobic glycolysis is called as Warburg's effect. Now, what was happening in case of oxidative phosphorylation there in presence of oxygen they were going for oxidative phosphorylation and generating 36 to 38 ATP normally but in the rapidly dividing cells this process does not take place oxidative phosphorylation does not take place instead even in the presence of excessive amount of oxygen the cell is going for aerobic glycolysis this is called as Warburg effect now the question is why they are going okay now over here in this process of aerobic glycolysis the glucose is changing to lactic acid and this aerobic glycolysis is taking even when sufficient amount of oxygen is present. Normally, this aerobic glycolysis is taking in absence of oxygen. But even in presence of oxygen, the cell is not going for oxidative phosphorylation. Instead, they are going for aerobic glycolysis. Why? Because via the process of aerobic glycolysis, a lot of metabolic intermediates are produced which is required by rapidly dividing cells and these metabolic intermediates, they are providing new proteins, lipids, amino acids and even nucleic acids which is required for cell proliferation. Okay, And in the process, only 2 ATP is, is generated. So, in normally dividing cells of our body, 
where there is no much requirement of you know metabolic intermediates uh, over there oxidative phosphorylation will be utilized mainly for generating energy but in rapidly dividing cells both benign as well as malignant rapidly dividing cells there is an increased requirement of metabolic intermediates so they are going to switch from oxidative phosphorylation towards aerobic glycolysis because they require metabolic intermediates okay so remember this aerobic glycolysis they will support cell proliferation okay remember so this is what is the Warburg effect and this is the second important function of mitochondria that is they provide metabolic intermediates in rapidly dividing cell. This is called as intermediate metabolism. The third important function of mitochondria is in facilitating what is called as cell death. Okay. So let us see over here with the help of this diagram let us understand now. Now try to understand over here that this H plus gradient that is this H plus that is basically increasing in the intermembrane space and then which is going again inside towards the core mitochondria this is responsible for atp generation in short this concentration gradient is very important for generation of atp now for example if there is any kind of injury to the cell okay the cell is having many kind of injury because of this basic injury in the cell what is very important that there is uh, whenever there is any kind of injury to the cell and the cell cannot survive okay in that situation the mitochondria opens a pore called as mptp that is membrane permeability transition pore also called as membrane permeability transition pore that is the mptp now once this mptp is activated what is going to happen all the H plus ions that is present in the intermembrane space, they are coming out and whatever electrochemical gradient that was created is lost. So, as a result, there is no more ATP generation and in this situation, when the MPTP becomes active, the cell death that will occur is by the process of necrosis. So, this is the number one mechanism of cell death. Now, second very important point over here that we have to keep in our mind is the second important way of cell death is by apoptosis. Now, what happens over here that certain channels which are exclusive of MPTP, they are not MPTP, like your back's back channel or your mitochondrial outer membrane permeabilization pore that is MOMP pore. Okay, So, this back's back channel in uh, conjunction with the MOMP pores, okay, this becomes active. And this allows, this allows the transfer of certain enzymes from inside the mitochondria that is called as cytochrome C. This cytochrome C is stabilizing an apoptosome complex and ultimately they are stimulating certain enzymes that is known as caspases. And once these enzymes are active, they are going to trigger cell death by the process of apoptosis. Okay. So, this MPTP and this MOMP or backs back channel, they are exclusive of each other. Okay. They are triggering cell death by another mechanism. Okay. So, the second pathway wherein the cell death is initiated by the stimulation of caspase is triggering the cell death by apoptosis. So, mitochondria has an important role in cell death. Okay. So, any kind of toxin, ischemia or trauma is there. They will stimulate the MPTP channels and because of that, the hydrogen gradient that was created is lost and ultimately they lead to ATP generation, uh, ultimately there is no ATP generation and leading to cell death by necrosis. Whereas, whenever there is a net pro-apoptotic signal, now remember in the next chapter we will read uh, about apoptosis in details wherein we are going to understand what are pro-apoptotic signals, what is anti-apoptotic signals. Okay, In that situation, we will understand that whenever there is a net increase of pro-apoptotic signals, they will stimulate the back's back MOMP channels and as a result, the cytochrome C enzyme from inside the mitochondria is going to come out into the cytoplasm and ultimately they are going to stabilize the apoptosome complex stimulating the caspase enzyme which is going to trigger programmed cell death by apoptosis. So, this is how the mitochondria is also playing an important role in cell death. Okay. So, I hope these functions are very clear. The three important functions of the mitochondria. Number one was your energy generation as we have already seen. Okay. The second important function was intermediate metabolism. The third was cell death. Okay. So, with this the discussion on mitochondria is over. Now, we are going to understand the next topic of discussion that is cell signaling. It is very, very important. Now, intercellular signaling is very important for developing embryo, for maintaining tissue organization and to ensure that all tissues are acting together as in concert. If there is a loss of intercellular signaling, it can lead to unregulated growth like for example seen in cancer or it can or there can be detrimental response to ex external stress that is shock 
if the cells are not working together their response to to, to stress can become a detrimental response example exemplified by shock now remember multiple a cell is receiving multiple kinds of signals and all these signals has to be integrated so that we can get a rational output out of all these signals so what are these signals so the signals can be responsible for just living or the signals might be required just for living of a cell or they might facilitate differentiation of a cell or they might you know uh, they they might uh, uh, you know induce cell proliferation or they might induce the cell to perform a specialized function or to have certain unique response so this is all is very important about the different signals so what are the different types of cell signals so let us try and understand now the different types of cell signals number 1 is the danger and the pathogen signals for example when we read about the immune system we will read about damp and pam so basically these immune signals that is the danger and the pathogen signal they are basically stimulating the innate immune cells via the innate immune receptors okay similarly via the cell to cell contact with the help of adhesion molecules and gap junctions okay there is signaling between the two cells via the cell to cell contact okay just as we have read about the gap junctions at the level of the heart then cell to extracellular matrix contact as you have already seen it is facilitated by means of hemidesmosomes and it is and the transmembrane protein over there are the integrins okay so again this is one type of signaling between the cell and the extracellular matrix and via the secreted molecule now for example there might be secretion of growth factors cytokines or even hormones okay which might basically uh, you know act as a signal okay so these are the different types of signals that can alter the cell function now let us uh, read about the different signaling pathways now always remember the signaling pathways can be paracrine paracrine means any one cell is releasing certain signals which is affecting the nearby cells only so paracrine signaling is the one when it is affecting the cells in immediate vicinity similarly autocrine signaling is when molecule secreted by a cell is affecting the same cell that is autocrine synaptic means when the neurons for example the neurons are secreting the neurotransmitters at the synapses between two electrically charged uh, cells okay so and and at the synapses that particular neurotransmitter is released which is acting on the target cell so this is synaptic signaling then we are having endocrine signaling wherein a mediator is released into the blood which is acting as a, at a target which is present at a distance so these are the four very important types of signaling paracrine autocrine synaptic and endocrine signaling now whatever the signals these are relayed to the cell via a specific receptor so whatever the signals they are relayed to the cell via a specific receptor and this cell receptor that we see this can be present either at the surface of a cell or they might be intracellular receptors so receptors in in a cell can be present either at the cell surface or they can be intracellular so intracellular receptors basically they are uh, you know exemplified by the presence of transcription factors in the cytoplasm they might act as an intracellular receptor and basically they are activated by lipid soluble ligand so those ligands okay which are crossing the plasma membrane and then uh, they they are combining with the intracellular receptor example vitamin d and steroid hormone these are lipid soluble substances they are acting as a ligand and they are basically activating the receptors which are present inside the cytoplasm for example the nuclear hormone receptor present in the cytoplasm okay so these are the intracellular receptors which are activated by lipid soluble ligands the lipid sol soluble ligands example lipid soluble substances like vitamin d and steroid hormones and they are activating nu uh, nuclear hormone receptors which are present in cytoplasm now small non now this was one example okay another example is sometimes non small uh, small non polar molecule for example gases which are produced by one cell type in the vicinity which is uh, active influencing the activity of adjacent cell like paracrine signaling example nitric oxide which is a gas produced by the endothelial cells okay they are diffusing freely inside the smooth muscle cells which are present nearby causing smooth muscle relaxation and in this way they are controlling vasomotor tone so this is all about your intracellular receptors and the the different examples of the intracellular receptors similarly we are having cell surface receptors as well so usually the cell surface receptors are transmembrane proteins okay which are having an extracellular domain so what is the meaning of this for example if this is the cell membrane transmembrane protein means which are spanning the entire membrane and they are having some domain extracellularly where some ligand is going to come and attach this is basically your 
cell surface receptor which is having an extracellular domain for binding with the ligand okay so once the ligand binds to the domain of the cell surface receptors they can have many functions for example they can open ion channels at the level of synapse or they can stimulate g protein g protein is a gtp binding regulatory protein they can stimulate g proteins or they can stimulate endogenous or associated enzymes especially tyrosine kinase enzyme or they can trigger a proteolytic event whenever a proteolytic event is occurring and the protein part uh, fragment that is formed they stimulate the transcription factors so these are the four important downstream activities of ligand binding to the domain they can open an ion channel as in a synapse they can either activate the g proteins okay that is the gtp binding regulatory protein or they can activate tyrosine kinase which might either be present endogenously or they might be associated enzyme along with the receptor or they might stimulate proteolytic activity now the two important receptors that is the gpcr g protein coupled receptor and the tyrosine kinase associated receptor these are the two important cell surface receptors which are responsible for cell proliferation okay remember proteolytic change whenever they occur they are involved in multiple pathways this last this proteolytic event that occurs they can be seen in multiple pathways having different function especially the notch pathway wnt signaling pathway or hedgehog signaling pathway and normally they are influencing the normal development okay so they are influencing normal development okay now downstream whatever the pathway whatever pathways whether it be the you know any kind of pathways or any kind of signaling pathways downstream of that we will see either phosphorylation or dephosphorylation of target molecules okay and very importantly these pathways they are deregulated in developmental disorders and even malignancies so whatever i have spoken with you right now we have started with the signaling pathways where have we have seen the different types of signaling and in any of these signaling they are basically relaying the signal to the specific receptor and the cell receptor can either be intracellular or they can be present on the surface of the cell in the cell surface receptors mainly the gpcr tyrosine kinase associated receptors are associated with cell proliferation other types are basically involved in normal development and in any kind of signaling pathway downstream there is either phosphorylation or dephosphorylation and deregulation of these pathways are implicated in developmental disorders as well as in malignancies now we are going to start the individual signal transduction pathways in association with the different kinds of receptors so basically i will just give you a basic insight into what happens in a signal transduction pathway so a ligand is basically going and binding to a receptor and once they are binding to the receptor they are inducing certain changes in the receptor that means they will cause clustering or receptor cross linking for example if a receptor is one like this so once the ligand binds okay they will dimerize or they will trimerize so they will cluster and they will form a complex and they will have a conformational change and they will become active or for example they can have a change in the structure okay so once the ligand is binding to the receptor and activating it they become activated by a clustering or receptor cross linking or by change in its structure so what happens this is followed by a conformational change in the cytosolic tail of the receptor now any receptor that is present in the cell surface they also have a tail inside the cytoplasm so they also have a conformational change and that is followed by intracellular events okay for example formation or modification of a biochemical intermediate occurs so in so inside the cell there are certain intracellular biochemical events that occurs and ultimately there will be production of an activated transcription factor which is going to enter the nucleus and alter the pattern of gene expression this is what happens usually in 90 95% of the cases this is what is happening ultimately we have to regulate the gene expression so this is the basics of all the signal transduction pathways so let us first start with the receptors which are associated with the kinase activity or with the enzyme activity so let us see over here pay a lot of attention there are two types one kind of receptor if you see number one type which is a non receptor tyrosine kinase okay and another type as we are seeing over here if you look over here another type this is the receptor with a with associated ty uh, tyrosine kinase activity we call it as rtk receptor with associate tyrosine kinase activity too so there are two types so what is the difference the difference over here is number one the non receptor tyrosine kinase is a type of a receptor you can see which is shown in purple okay this itself doesn't have tyrosine kinase activity but on the cytoplasmic side you can appreciate a particular domain which gets associated once the receptor is activated and this separate domain is basically having the tyrosine kinase activity okay that is why we are calling it as non receptor tyrosine kinase 
okay similarly the second type that is a receptor tyrosine kinase they are having intrinsic uh, you know tyrosine kinase activity that the receptor itself is having the tyrosine kinase activity that is the rtk so let us begin with this and then as we discuss each one of them we will uh, read the same in this diagram so we are having two kinds very importantly first we will discuss about tyrosine kinase receptor what is the meaning this is also known as receptor tyrosine kinase wherein the receptor itself is having the enzyme activity that is the tyrosine kinase activity now this is basically an integral membrane protein example the receptors which are present for insulin epidermal growth factor or pdgf factor all these receptors for these uh, molecules these are mainly tyrosine kinase receptors so we are talking mainly about the receptor tyrosine kinase this receptor we are talking about so what is happening over here let us try and understand the ligand whenever the ligand is binding they are inducing a change a cross linking of the receptors and they activate the intrinsic tyrosine kinase domains of the receptor which are located at the cytoplasmic tail as we can appreciate over here so this is the receptor this is the tyrosine kinase uh, receptor or the receptor tyrosine kinase so once the ligand is binding these two subunits they cross link they come together and then they are activating the kinase domain or the tyrosine kinase activity which is present at the cytoplasmic tail at the cytoplasmic tail okay so till here you have understood that how the uh, the receptor tyrosine kinase is getting activated by the ligand okay so this is the first the second thing is the non receptor tyrosine kinase based receptor and the most important example and the prototype of such enzymes are the src family kinase now several receptors they don't have intrinsic tyrosine kinase as i have already mentioned like for example this receptor over here by itself it is not having any tyrosine kinase activity but and for and, and the examples of these receptors are for example your immune receptors or some cytokine receptors or even the integrin receptors okay now for them okay separate intracellular tyrosine kinase is present which becomes active only when the ligand is binding to the receptor now for example a ligand has gone and bound to this receptor cause the receptor to cross link once the receptor becomes active then a separate tyrosine kinase which is present intracellularly will go and get activate okay and then they are going to start working so in, in 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 whatever way the ligand is activating the tyrosine kinase whether they activate the non receptor tyrosine kinase or the receptor tyrosine kinase after once the tyrosine kinase enzyme is active this is going to lead to downstream phosphorylation of the motifs which are present on the receptor or on other proteins so the ultimate thing that is going to happen that whether it be the non receptor tyrosine kinase or the receptor tyrosine kinase ultimately they will cause phosphorylation as you can appreciate and the phosphorylation can either be occurring of certain molecules which are either present on the receptors or certain molecules which are present separately inside okay so this is an intracellular protein so they might cause phosphorylation of either certain uh, motifs present on the surface of receptors or they can directly cause phosphorylation of intracellular proteins as we can appreciate in this particular diagram now remember phosphatases they remove the phosphate residues and usually they inhibit the signal transduction so normally the activation of the tyrosine kinase and phosphorylation will stimulate certain cell activity and they are stimulating the gene expression mainly okay but for example anything that is removing the phosphorylation for example phosphatase enzyme they are going to inhibit the signal transduction pathway so this is the number one signal transduction pathway hope it is clear to everyone the second type is mediated via the g protein couple receptor that is a gpcr pathway now these g protein couple receptor these are transverse uh, they traverse this type of receptor is going to traverse the uh, the plasma membrane seven times so they go one two three four five six seven times and because of this okay they are called as seven transmembrane protein and because this looks like a snake so we also call it as serpentine receptors there are more than 1500 such receptors in our body now the ligands bind with once the ligand is going to bind with the g protein couple receptor this g protein this gpcr receptor is going to associate with a g protein which is also called as intracellular gtp binding protein so what is happening once the ligand is binding with the g protein coupled receptor they are basically going to get associate with the g protein okay so what is going to happen and once this association occurs so normally the the g protein if you see they have associated gdp 
but once the g protein coupled receptor binds with the g protein okay this gtp converts to gtp gtp okay and once this conversion occurs they generate certain secondary you know certain molecules or, or se certain secondary messengers like camp and ip3 which is helping in further intracellular signaling okay and very important this camp and inositol triphosphate is very very important for intracellular signaling and for the signal transduction pathways now this ip3 once stimulated they are also causing release of calcium from the endoplasmic reticulum okay so this is the structure if you can appreciate the seven transmembrane protein or the serpentine uh, receptor which is traversing the plasma membrane seven times so once the ligand is binding over here to the gpcr receptor they are going to go and they are going to bind uh, the G protein and this G protein, the GTP is going to convert to GTP and then ATP generation will be there. And ultimately in this process, secondary messengers like CAMP and IP3 will be released, which will lead to further signaling. So this is the second important pathway that is the G protein coupled receptor related signal transduction pathway. Now, the third important pathway that we have already read, that is the nuclear receptor mediated pathway. Now, what happens over here? It is very simple. Over here, what is going to happen? A lipid soluble ligand, for example, a nuclear hormone that is a steroid hormone or a vitamin D. Okay, they are going to traverse the plasma membrane. This is the plasma membrane. So, they are lipid soluble. So, they are going to traverse. And then in the cytoplasm, they will meet with certain hormone receptors. Okay, intra, so this is an example of a intracellular receptor. So, they will go and they will bind with the hormone receptor. And once this complex is formed, okay, this hormone hormone receptor complex is formed, they will translocate into the nucleus this is the nucleus they will translocate and they will go and bind to the nuclear dna and they might stimulate or they might inhibit gene transcription so they will facilitate transcription of nuclear hormone target gene okay so this is all is about the nuclear receptor mediated pathway okay whatever i have explained to you is written on the left hand side you might read it later on now the other classes of receptors so we have seen these three important pathways okay one is we have read about the uh, receptors with kinase activity then we have read about the g protein coupled receptor then we are reading about the nuclear receptor mediated pathways and ultimately now we are going to see the other classes of receptors also we are going to appreciate now now the other classes of receptors are more important for embryonic development as well as the cell fate determination and they also helps in the functioning of the mature cells okay for example the cells of the immune system now, they rely on protein-protein interaction to transduce any kind of signal. So, as I already told you, there is a G-protein coupled receptor signaling and tyrosine kinase signaling, mainly responsible for cell proliferation. But there are other signaling also like the protein-protein interaction. Now, for example, the receptor proteins of the notch family. Now, for example, we can see that this is the notch receptor. So, what you are looking over here, this is a mainly, this is a notch receptor over here. And once they are binding with the notch ligand over here, what is happening that there is a cleavage of the notch receptor. So, there is a breakdown of this receptor. So, the notch cleavage occurs, okay. And what happens, there is a proteolytic cleavage of the receptor once the ligand is binding to the notch receptor. And whatever fragment that is there, that is the intracellular notch, that is the IC notch that is remaining, they are going and they are binding, they are translocating inside the nucleus and they are binding with a particular uh, part of the nuclear DNA and they are causing transcription of the notch target gene over here. Okay, So, this is how the notch pathway is taking place, that is the notch family proteins are acting in this manner. Then lastly we are having the wnt or the frizzled pathway we are having the wnt and the frizzled pathway now what is happening over here try and understand there is a ligand over here okay before we go over there i want to give light to some important thing normally in our body there is a particular factor called as beta catenin which is present mainly in the cytoplasm okay and normally this beta catenin is a very important protein which is helping in cell proliferation and differentiation okay so normally when cell proliferation is not required then this beta catenin is basically degraded by a complex called as proteasomal degradation complex is there so that is going to bind with the beta catenin and is going to keep them degraded okay so this occurs normally when the growth is not required but suppose when growth is required in that situation when a ligand okay when a wnt ligand is going and binding to a receptor that is a frizzled receptor which is nothing but a type of g protein coupled transmembrane receptor okay 
So this is basically going and binding to the fissile receptor and once they are binding to the fissile receptor what they are doing with the help of another cytoplasmic protein disheveled they are binding with the proteasome degradation complex and they are not allowing the proteasomal degradation complex to function. So they are disrupting the degradation complex. In this situation what happened that this beta catenin which was earlier degraded by the proteasomal degradation complex now becomes stabilized and free. And once they become stabilized and free, they are going inside the nucleus binding with the, uh, uh, with the DNA and then they are stimulating the process of transcription and allowing the cell proliferation to occur. Okay. So, this is your main WNT result pathway and then you have the notch pathway. So, basically the net effect of all the other of all the above pathways is either an enzyme activation or inactivation, nuclear or cytoplasmic localization of the transcription factor transcription factor stimulation or inhibition, actin polymerization, depolymerization, protein degradation or stabilization or stimulation of feedback inhibitory loop or stimulatory loop. So, these are the net effect of the above pathways. Now, we will also understand the role of adapter protein. Now, these are organizing intracellular signaling pathways. So, these are organizing intracellular signaling pathways. So, the molecular connectors, these are molecular connectors which are linking different enzymes and they promote assembly of different complex which will help in later downstream signaling. These are, these can be either membrane protein or these can be cytoplasmic protein as well. Okay. So, they are modulating the signaling pathways as well. That is the role of an adapter protein. Now, they are, now basically, they think that this entire signaling trans, uh, the signal transduction pathway that we have read about, this is like a networking phenomenon, okay, wherein the protein-protein complex, they are acting as nodes and these nodes can either receive a biochemical event or they can, they can uh, create a biochemical event and these biochemical events are called as hubs, okay. So, this is very important and in the end, I would like to end the signal transduction pathway very important on a very important note. We will take an example of a normal signaling Okay, which is based on tyrosine kinase based growth factor receptor. This is just a normal growth, this is just a normal growth signaling pathway, okay, in our body. Okay, so suppose in our body, a growth signaling is required. So, what is happening that when a growth factor is going, okay, and they are binding to a receptor, they are causing the receptor to dimerize and there is a cross-linking. So, two such subunits, they came together and they bound. As they did that, what happened that there was autophosphorylation occurred of the tyrosine residues occurred. So, autophosphorylation of the tyrosine residues occurred and after that, they stimulated a particular adapter protein called as the bridging protein. <coughs> Excuse me. Once this bridging protein got activated, they converted the inactive ROS into active ROS. And this active ROS over here, they started to stimulate the PI3K AKT mTOR pathway. This is one pathway of cell proliferation and also the RAF MAP kinase pathway. Okay. And ultimately, they cause activation of transcription, stimulation of the MYC protein and ultimately the cell cycle progression occurred with growth and differentiation of the cell. This is a very basic growth factor mediated normal growth signaling pathway. Now, once the growth is achieved, okay, the GTP over here that was formed is inactivated by hydrolysis to GDP and the RAS will again become inactive and the entire pathway will stop. So, this is a very basic normal growth signaling pathway and you have to write this answer also in the exam when the signal transduction pathways are asked. The normal growth signaling pathway has to be, uh, you know, confirmed, uh, has to be, the normal growth signaling pathway has to be shown in this answer as well. And this is very important because if you don't understand this, then understanding the chapter of neoplasia will become difficult. Okay, so with this, we have completed the signal transduction pathways. Now, we are going to just read about the basic important transcription factors. So, most of the signaling pathways, they will ultimately alter the gene transcription via the transcription factor stimulation or, if the or via the transcription factor translocation into the nucleus. The example of these, uh, you know, genes which are uh, encoding for the transcription factors including MYC gene or the June gene which is regulating the cell division. Now, transcription factor domains, they bind to the, they, they can bind to DNAs or they can bind to small molecules or they can also bind to intracellular regulatory protein. So, leading to translocation from the cytoplasm to the nucleus. Once they are binding to the target site, they can lead to translocation from the cytoplasm to the nucleus. They can alter 
their own half life okay they can expose certain dna binding regions like they can expose the promoters or the enhancer region they can promote the binding to components of rna polymerase complex to augment the transcription factor activity as well so with this we have completed the part 4 of the series of cell as a unit of health and disease if you have enjoyed please do share and subscribe thank you very much for watching this particular video